Hello and welcome to Common Ground, an inside look at Suffolk County. I'm your host, Sheriff Steve Tompkins. So we're just about through the political season. We've got the general election coming up uh, in November, but we're past the primaries, and it was one that was incredibly... Uh, some of the, the wins were unexpected, some of the losses were unexpected, but at the end of the day, the city gained a new vitality, a new vibrancy. And that's because the people that are coming in really have rolled up their sleeves. They really have gotten out there, knocked on doors, and, and have told the people, this is what I'd like to do. But before I do that, I'd like to hear from you to see what it is that you think needs to get done. And so I always believe that that collaborative effort is meaningful. And to that end, we have a new state representative here, and that would be Mr. John Santiago, who unseated a long-term um, city, uh, I'm sorry, state representative, uh, Byron Rushing, who's a good guy, put in some good time, did some good work. But as they say, it's a new day. John, thank you so much for coming. No, my pleasure. Happy really to be here. It. No, thanks for so, inviting me. Before we get into the nitty gritty, tell us a little bit about your background. How is it that you came to civic engagement? Well, so a little bit about myself. I was born in Puerto Rico. Uh, we came to the mainland, as we would say, at a young age. I was about two years old. Mm -hmm. And we moved around quite a bit. I ultimately ended up in Boston in the late 80s, early 90s, lived here. And I think it was those really experiences growing up in Roxbury, lived on Ruthen Street, um, that really impacted my life, uh, particularly the infection of my uncle. He was infected with HIV oh, and sorry. ultimately passed away. But watching that uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, and the role that that had on my family, um, because his son, my cousin, became an AIDS orphan, and watching that happen in Boston, Massachusetts, the mecca of healthcare, mm. really impacted me and got me into healthcare. And so from an early age, I was very much dedicated to service. Um, and to working with communities of color, people who needed to, people needed help. And I went to college, went to med school, but I knew I wanted to serve, and so I spent five years abroad. Prior to going to med school, I spent some time in the Peace Corps, mm -hmm. uh, you know, spent some time working in Africa, lived in France, uh, really dedicated my life to service, and, you know, I thought no better way to serve than to be a doctor. So I became a doctor, got my dream job at Boston City Hospital, otherwise known as Boston Medical Center. So mm. work with patients every day, serve my community. But I've been a big believer in public service. In addition to the Peace Corps, I'm also captain in the Army. And I really look at this run as an extension of that. Okay. That's why I decided to run for office. So now, wait a minute. I just want to make sure I understand this. So yeah. you're a practicing medical doctor? That's correct. I work in, I work in the ER. I'm an okay. ER doctor at Boston Medical Center. Okay, so you, you work in one of the more challenging arms of sure. the hospital. And you're going to are you going to, you're going to continue to practice medicine and serve I will. as a state I think rep. it's important that we do both. I mean, not many people are familiar with the lives of emergency medicine doctor. I mean, you're not right. a trauma surgeon, 24 hour call all day. A full time emergency medicine doctor works about three days a week, full time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you talk to many ER doctors, they have second lives, and I think I'd probably work one to two days a week. But more importantly, I think one job informs the other. What's going to make me a good policymaker is my experiences on the ground. Um, and how those things get translated. You know, when I see a, a young black or brown man who's been shot in the chest, I mean, I just took care of a guy who got shot in the legs two days ago, mm -hmm. um, why people, why they show up in the emergency room, why someone shows up with a heart attack because they can't pay their, their medications, and they, they don't have access to health care. These are all, you know, public policy decisions and issues that we need to address. And I think my lived experience can really help uh, give insight to the process. Was this the first time that you've run for office? First time run for office and was very fortunate to be uh, victorious mm -hmm. and uh, I know that not many people are the first time but you know, we put the work in and I'm um, happy to have won. So when you told people that you were going to run for office what was the immediate feedback and I'm not just talking yeah. about your family but I'm talking about those around you, your colleagues, your neighbors, what do they think you know um, about a John Santiago uh, run for state representative? Well, I think they were excited about it. I think they knew that uh, I work hard. Uh, I put the, you know, I put the work in. Uh, I thought about it. I'm a thoughtful person. Um, but they realized that there were significant challenges. Mm -hmm. As you know, the politics of Boston can be tough to navigate around. Mm -hmm. And particularly taking on a longtime incumbent. Uh, Mr. Rushing had been there for, you know, 34 years, 35 years. Mm -hmm. uh, a district that really loves him and he's done some good work. Right. But I thought people, my friends, family, neighbors, um, thought it was time for change, given the situation. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I live near Mass Ave. I walk down to work at Boston Medical Center, and, you know, you can't walk down 
mass have without noticing the opioid epidemic, right. how it's affecting our communities. Right. I mean, one in four people know someone who's affected by substance use disorder. And so I wanted to do something about it, not just as a physician, but as a public health practitioner, as someone who lives in the neighborhood, who sees this every day, who affects my quality of life. And so I thought it was about time. And when I feel prepared, whether it was you know, joining the Peace Corps, going abroad, when I do the homework and I put the work in, usually good things happen. I was just very fortunate uh, for us to come out on top. Well, you know, I mean, I think it's easy to say that you were fortunate, particularly after you've won. Mm -hmm. But I think there's more to it. You know, as having someone who's run two campaigns and worked on other campaigns, it's like marshalling a small army, mm -hmm. frankly. You know, and all of the people that you have to get to support you and then all of the different components and elements of running a campaign mm -hmm. is an arduous task. And it really pulls away from... Uh, who you are and what you do. Are you a married man? Do you have kids? I, I am married. Okay. I recently got married uh, less than a year ago. Congratulations. Um, thank you very much. No kids, mm -hmm. uh, but my wife, her name's Alex. Uh, I met her when I was abroad. She's French, and she moved here about uh, two years ago. Okay. But she was supported from day one. And, I, I mean, you're exactly right. It is marshalling an army. It is organizing communities. But to that extent, you know, I, I spent several years working in communities, organizing communities mm. as a Peace Corps volunteer. So it was very similar in that regard. Uh, but it's very challenging, uh, finding volunteers, working with people. I personally wanted to make this the most grassroots campaign that the South End, Roxbury, had ever seen. And to that extent, I knocked on 8,000 doors myself and really spoke to people who had, the vote hadn't been asked for in, in years. I right. uh, spoke to them in languages that they understood, right. that they cared about. And as a result, I think that's why we won. I mean, I think I met so many people on the campaign trail that said, this is the first time anyone's ever asked me for my vote. And uh, That's amazing. Yeah. That's almost yeah. unfathomable that mm -hmm. in all that time that no one's knocked on their door mm -hmm. giving them a phone call to ask mm -hmm. for their vote. Mm -hmm. Tell us, what did you hear from these folks behind those 8,000 doors? You know, the common themes. Yeah, so I think there were three main issues. I mean, the district front is, is very diverse. It goes all the way from 1 Dalton Street, which is the big skyscraper going up. The, you know, luxury. Down in the back bay. That's correct. Across yeah. from the Hilton and the Sheraton. Yep. Right. Um, so, you know, very different community from right. down the south end, from parts of Fenway to parts of Lower Roxbury. Okay. So it's very diverse with respect to race. Class you got a issues. little bit of some. You got a little bit of everybody. Yeah, absolutely, um, but the disparities are so stark as well. I mean, from one end to the other, the life expectancy decreases by about thirty years. Mm -hmm. um, so, as you can imagine, depending on what neighborhood you're in and who you're speaking to, the issues change. But on the course of you know several months campaigning, three issues continued to arise, and number one was the opioid epidemic. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was hard to not knock on a door without you know talking about the opioid epidemic or. Right. Spanish, did you let people know that you were a medical doctor, or did you just forego that part of the conversation? No, I think we talked about that. Okay. You know, I, I think that so was... that they knew when you're talking about the opioid epidemic, they knew that you were coming from a place where you had some real understanding. Absolutely. I mean, there's not a day that goes by in Boston Medical Center when I'm not taking care of someone who's right. under the throes of addiction, um, and so it's something I see every day. It's something I experience as a resident as well. I mean, sure. they're concerned about needles on the ground, sure. people walking, you know, in kind of a, in an unsafe manner, and you know, I see it every day when I walk. The second issue was housing. And there were two really, you know, vantage points to that. There were the people that had been there for a long time, particularly in the South End, bought their house, you know, 30 years ago, why the, the prices have gone up, gone up significantly, but can no longer pay the property taxes. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there's a significant community that was BHA, subsidized housing, Section 8, and that they were scared about displacement, issues of that nature. And the third issue was, um, ultimately, is what I call gentrification, but it was mm -hmm. displayed as... I feel like I live in two different neighborhoods. Yeah. And I would say, tell me more. And they would talk about the fact that they, they feel you know, disengaged with certain sectors of the neighborhood. People aren't listening to them, people aren't engaging them, and didn't have a voice. And so those were the three major issues that I saw on the campaign trail. So, you know, there's two things that, that jump out at me. One is, from that district, your district, the 9th of Suffolk, you have people that have incredible affluence, uh -huh. you know, juxtaposed to people that probably are struggling yeah. in the throes of poverty. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about just walking that expanse, you know, you're seeing a little bit of, of everybody. Mm -hmm. The second point is, when you talk about people being forced out of their homes, their apartments, their houses, places where generations have lived because they can no longer afford to live there. I mean, I think that that's a real bad commentary, not just on the city of Boston or the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, but on our country. Mm -hmm. You know, that you know, one bedroom is like maybe upwards of $2,000 sure. if you're in the inner core. I mean, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I think it's ridiculous. And I think something has to be done about that. As a state representative, how do you mount that charge to say, we can no longer continue to 
displaced people uh, who have th these communities are the communities that they've grown up in, that their parents moved to, their grandparents moved to, they're raising their sure. kids. Now they can no longer live there. Mm -hmm. How do you get other legislators to join up with you to say, we really have got to roll up our sleeves and fight this? Well, I think a couple of things. I think, as, as you suggested, it's a very complicated issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think no state rep is going to be able to deal with this alone. Uh, I'm elected to serve in the body of 160 people, right. 200, a greater body. Um, but what can we do? I think what I told people on the ground is that you'll have a champion, a voice that will be speaking for you. And I think that's what people were looking for, um, to be heard. I mean, I found that campaign, campaigning was very much like medicine. You know, when people come to the emergency room, I don't always have the answers. I don't always have the medications. I don't always, I can't always treat their uh, malady. But what I can do is I can listen to them. And listening and, and championing them and pointing them in the right direction to find services uh, can be an effective, cathartic uh, answer. And so when it comes to these people who haven't been heard, um, I think the first step is listening to them. Because I also feel that the people closest to the situation probably have the answer as well. Right. And, and people are just looking for someone to, to be by their side, to stand up to them when a developer says, you know, we need to do X, Y, or Z. Or, um, you know, these prices, you know, um, in terms of displacement, I mean, I met many families who were scared about being displaced because um, the owner of their building was going to turn into market rate. And I think if someone with some influence or, and can, can engage the developers or the owners and say, listen, these people have been here for a long time. Right. They deserve to be here. And this is good for our community to have this diversity. I think we can make some headway in that. So when you look, I, I want to transition over to the opiate situation. Mm -hmm. And what you often hear is that a lot of people have kind of thro fallen into the throes of addiction, opiate addiction, through prescription medication yeah. and the like. But um, I'm, like you, travel basically the same, uh, uh, traverse the same areas that you were just talking about because our facilities are right there mm -hmm. in the South End. And the overwhelming number of people mm -hmm. that seem to be addicted to opiates. You know, if you travel out to the West Coast, I was out in California recently, San Diego, Los Angeles, San Francisco, it's even worse out there because of the warmer climate. Mm -hmm. I can't believe that all of these people have fallen into the throes of addiction from prescription medication. Mm -hmm. Do you have another look at how, all, it seems like almost overnight, and mm -hmm. I know it's not overnight, but it feels that mm -hmm. way, it, this has just exploded. Mm -hmm. What's your thoughts on that? How did this happen? Well, I think it's a couple of things. I, I think, I mean, you're absolutely right. There's no doubt that the prescription drugs played a significant role in this, mm -hmm. and that's how people get addicted. But ultimately, people try drugs because they're missing something, because um, there's a lack of hope. Um, there's a lack of ability to do something with their lives, a lack of economic opportunity, education, and so they divert themselves and go get perhaps high. Mm -hmm. um, you're exactly right. This is the public health crisis of our generation, yeah. and that's a big reason why I ran, because I think um, it's very sad. I mean, just the other day I was taking care of someone, um, actually just yesterday, um, she had blood streaming through her entire body, right? She'd been, you know, to the point where she's infected her heart valves multiple times, and they've had to have been replaced. And here we are in the emergency room, you have a very uh, bad condition, yeah. very sick need to stay here, and she's telling me she has to go out and shoot up, mm -hmm. risking her life, you know, taking her off the antibiotics. And these people are sick and they need help. Yeah. I think, you know, we can't turn our back on them. They, we need to support them 110%. That's what I plan to do from a policy level. Um, and I think the insight that I see, or that I have as an emergency medicine physician, is um, it's gonna be helpful to that. Um, you know, I, I've seen pol policies created around big round tables and how they're translated to the real world. Um, it, the, it's, the rubber doesn't always meet the road. That's right. And I think um, I'll right. be able to give some light to that as a, as a physician in the state house. So as a doctor, tell me this, I, and I don't know that this is true and it may sound nonsensical to you. I was having a conversation a couple of years ago with someone about principally opiates and cocaine and so on and so sure. forth. And what they were saying is that Part of the reason that people can't shake the habit is the drugs, they're telling the body that this is a replacement for food and water and that the body really craves that and needs that. Is there any validity to that or was that just total nonsense? I'm not sure it's replacing food, mm -hmm. um, but there's no doubt. Well, I mean, that, the messages that it's sending to your body. Well, well, it creates this, you know, feedback mechanism where your body needs it. Right. And not just psychologically, but physically. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is why people go with, under, undergo withdrawal. I mean, that's your body telling you that you need some sort of substance to, to, to keep your body at its new baseline. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't have these drugs, uh, particularly you know, heroin and things like alcohol, um, you, know, you will undergo withdrawal, which in the case of alcohol can be life-threatening. And opioids, not necessarily life-threatening, but very 
um, uh, horrendous for the patient. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, some people would describe it as cruel and unusual punishment. Um, but um, that's what they're in, and so that's why we need to treat these people effectively. And the good thing is that we know what works. We know that if you give someone methadone, if you give someone Suboxone, Rivitrol, that these medications do work, and these medications do save lives. And it's about really doubling down on what we know works and, and finding new kind of ways to be innovative and bold um, in addressing the epidemic. And it's a very complicated issue, as you know. Yeah. Um, you know, no state representative, no sheriff, but I think together we can really fight for policy, policies that'll you know heal these people, not just medically, but spiritually as well, because ultimately that's what's going on. So methadone, Suboxone, Vivitrol, are these pacifiers or are these drugs something that can actually wean people off yeah. of the need to use the so drug? You, you bring up an excellent point, uh, a point that it took me a while to kind of understand as well. I remember being a medical student and being at the, uh, working in the VA and you know, someone was under the, you know, someone was going to treat for uh, substance use disorder. Okay. And I said, what's the point? Is the point to wean them off or mm -hmm. to keep them on it? And it could be both, but it's really up to the patient. I think that's up to the patient to determine, oh, okay. you know? I mean, do we, do we say the same things about high blood pressure, diabetes? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. We treat them, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, but the stigma around uh, substance use disorder um, leads us to think that, you know, we have to wean these people off, uh, which, you know, I don't necessarily think is the case. I mean, people have functioning lives using methadone, Suboxone, right, right. and if Suboxone's a pill that you could pick up your, your primary care doctor, which that's what, you know, policies that I would be fighting for, mm -hmm. well, let them pick it up, you know, and give people access to Suboxone. Um, but you're right, it doesn't really make sense, you know. I mean, I remember when I was studying, you know, I was like, shouldn't these people be weaning off? But, right. you know, right. um, if, if it's going to, you know, cause them to potentially use the drug again, put themselves at risk for heroin or fentanyl now, which can, you know, end their yeah, life, right. you know, Let's you know practice these harm reduction principles that we've been taught and uh, treat them effectively. So when we had our September fourth of this year is when we had our primary mm -hmm. uh, here in the Commonwealth, and in the city of Boston there was a, a dramatic sea change in the complexion and gender of the winners. Frankly, more women, more women of color, men of color. Um, it, it, it it seems that. And I don't know if this is a result of what's going on nationally, and people are just, they've had enough of the, what I would describe as nonsense. Mm -hmm. um, but more people of color, more women, are becoming more engaged in the civic process and running for office. Down the road, and this is probably speculation on your part, but I'm just curious as to what you think. Down the road, how do you think that's going to change the nature of not just this state, but the country, if more young folk, more women, more people of color get engaged politically. Well, I think it's a good thing for democracy. I think uh, if this, I mean, there was so much synergy around the different elections, this, this cycle, similar messaging, people looking, I mean, if you just look at the turnout numbers. I think mm -hmm. about um, over 5,000 people voted in our district. Not even when Deval Patrick won the primary, when all these communities of color came out. In my district, about 4,000 people came out. Okay. And so you saw a real thirst for change uh, in a certain direction. I think people were tired with the nonsense, looking for things to get done. People who, who speak their language, whether that's an actual another language or, you know, or understand what they're going through. Mm -hmm. And I think people like uh, you know, Ms. Presley, uh, myself, other people, um, really spoke to and understood the issues that their constituents were going through um, because they had that lived experience. And I think that's what ultimately what was about, what was inspiring and what um, spoke to people. Because at the end of the day, you know, we, you know, I can tell you all these stats about opioid epidemic and that sort of thing, but if you know, I can tell you, you know, what it's like to live on Mass Ave with you and to see that every day and how it affects your life and how you don't want your kids walking on needles, right. or the fact that I see this as a doctor, um, that gives us credibility. And I think that's why ultimately why many of us were successful. You know, when I'm out And talking, we also put the work in. Yeah, yeah. you put the work in. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. true. Yeah. You did. And, and running, running, running a campaign, yeah. as we mentioned, yeah. it's, a lot yeah. of, it's, uh, it's a lot of work. It's insane. You know, and it's funny because there are people that haven't run for office that kind of sometimes get it mixed up. They mm. think that there's this celebrity element mm. attached to being a, a, a public advocate. I'm not real good with the word public servant. <laughs> a public advocate, because when you walk into a room, people know you or they want to talk yeah. to you and they want to kind of sometimes just get your sense of things or unload their luggage onto sure. you. But people think there's uh, some celebrity attached to that. What I try to tell them is, this is tough work. 
This is hard work, and a lot of it actually takes place after 5 p.m. Mm -hmm. when you're going to community meetings. So you've had a full day of doing whatever it is that you do to take care of yourself and your families and your home and your pets and blah, blah, blah. And then you have to go to community meetings. So there, it may seem like this is something that's like celebrity-based, but this is really tough work, mm -hmm. you know, meaningful, but tough work. And so when I'm out there talking to people, I talk about the need to be civically engaged. Mm -hmm. I talk about the fact that you can't stand on the sidelines and just squawk. We get the government that we, we deserve. Absolutely. And the way we do that is to get engaged. And I think that when the public school system, not just here but across the country, began to eliminate civics, what I, I grew up in New York City, so they used to call it social studies, mm -hmm. but it's the same thing. You're taking away that element that teaches people how community and government work collaboratively. Mm -hmm. And so when I hear people say, well, it's only one vote, it doesn't matter, my yeah. vote doesn't count, they honestly believe it because they actually haven't been taught mm -hmm. how these things work hand in hand. How do you address that? If someone says to you, you know what, John, you're a good guy, and you're out there and you're doing the right thing, but you know what, it's just one vote, I don't care. You know, it doesn't mean... Well, I mean, I think me. you bring up a good point. I think the fact that civics, social studies, as you said, many people don't understand the connection or, you know, how that kind of works. But I also think it's a lack of hope. I think people have just mm -hmm. grown frustrated and tired with what's going on. And they've elected people or they've seen people in the same position for a number of years and they feel like their lives haven't changed. And they feel like no one's speaking to their issues. And, you know, it's funny. I mean, you've been in a couple of campaigns. And you've ran two. I'm mm -hmm. sure you've been a part of a whole host of others. And you know the campaign strategists, they come up with their list of you know, super voters. <laughs> and yeah. they say, you know, we think, we predict that, you know, 3,000 voters are going to vote yeah. in this certain election. Yeah. So they pull up their special list, and the idea is, you know, have a very targeted campaign to go after them. And, and typically what happens is the candidate says, no, but I want to speak to everyone. And, and right. then they, they wheel it back. Um, but, you know, the good thing is I've, I, I've done a fair bit of door knocking before I ran. Yeah. And I was very involved in different campaigns. I've door knocked the whole South and multiple times for years for other different candidates for other issues. Oh, okay. And so I knew the issues. Right. I knew what was going on. And, but I always said and I always maintained the belief that if you give people a reason to vote, they will vote. Yeah. You know, even an 18-year-old kid That's or right. a young person who's never really been engaged in the process. That's and right. the election day, I was meeting so many young people and families and different generations coming in, um, you know, coming to the poll, saying my name, you know, we came because you knocked on our door, because you asked for our vote, because you spoke to our nice. concerns, our values. Nice. I think that's what it's about. And I think, um, you used the word engagement, that's the word that I love to use as well. When you engage people, when you ask them, you know, similar to medicine. Um, in the emergency room, I got several minutes to sit down with you and for you to tell me something about your life, yeah. which perhaps is the worst day of your life, yeah. given the fact that you're here. Right. And so you have to make a connection, you have to speak with them in their language, and um, you have to give them a reason to believe and to hope and to go out there and hope Hopefully vote for you, yeah. So listen, um, we're out of time. I just want to thank you so much for coming by to talk to us and educate our, ve our viewers as to the issues that's important to you, the causes that you're going to champion mm -hmm. when you get up uh, to the state house. And I applaud your efforts, particularly as a first-time candidate, although someone who has been steeped in political mm -hmm. activity, a first-time candidate for really, really wanting to throw all of that weight on your shoulders and get out there to do what's done because you have a voice, you have um, opinions about things, but you want to see change effectuated, and you want it to be you want to be a part of the solution, mm -hmm. and not be a part of what I call the problem if you're just standing on the sidelines. So thank you for all that you're doing. Um, we look forward to yeah. you know many years of you being up at the state house and wherever your career might take you after that. But if there's anything that we can do, meaning the sheriff's department, law enforcement, public safety. Please let us know. We'll be there for you. Well, I appreciate your work, and I look forward to working with you um, as a state rep. Okay. you got to come and visit okay. us. you got to come and tour our No, facility. we'll do it. I'd love to. And I'd love to hear about the programs you guys are doing, because I hear you guys are uh, working with Vivitrol. Yes. See how we can, you know, work with one another and advocate for, you know, a, vul a vulnerable population. We'll be in touch. Talk Excellent. About that. Great. Thank you. All right, folks, we're going to go to a break, and on the other side, we have a, another new state representative, and that would be Miss Liz Miranda. So do uh, please do stay tuned.
your bike? Donating it to Goodwill may be the most incredible of all. Your donations help fund job placement and training for people in your community, which means your stuff can be more powerful than you think. Donate stuff, create jobs. Yeah. Heard about the scarecrow who won an award? He was outstanding in his field. <laughs> Todd's a great guy. I mean, look at him. What a sweetheart. Attaboy. Wait, Todd, what are you doing? How totally selfish and untod like of you. Come on, Todd. Come on, man. Testing. Why did the girl ask the mushroom to dance? Because he was a fun guy. I'll never forget the day our landlord called and said, read your lease. No pets allowed. My owner tells him my dog ate the lease, but that didn't work. And now I'm stuck in a shelter, but this pit bull is ready for a new crib. I'm loving, loyal, and play well with others. So don't be intimidated by all my muscles, because the biggest one I have is my heart. <laughs> That's right, I said it. Welcome back to Common Ground, an inside look at Suffolk County. I'm your host, Sheriff Steve Tompkins. Now, on this side of the break, we have another brand new state representative. And I got to tell you, September 4th was a crazy day. There was so much change, so much good, positive change that is going to bring a lot of energy to the city. And I actually tell you the God's honest truth, I'm going to get more people engaged in the civic process. And so to that end, we have Miss Liz Miranda, who Hi. won her race convincingly. Elizabeth, thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks Pleasure. for coming up. Really appreciate it. So look, let's start this way. Just quickly tell the, the viewers about your background. What brings you to civic engagement? Awesome. Well, first, I'm honored to be on the show with you. Um, I, am, I like to tell people that one of the first roles is I'm a sister, uh, a neighbor, a friend. Uh, I, my story begins in 1980 in the 5th fifth, fifth Suffolk District, actually with the, the district that I ran. Mm -hmm. I grew up in the Dudley Triangle. My mom was a teen mom. Um, she was at Madison Park High School, dropped out to have me. Mm -hmm. um, my father had a lot of children and wasn't in my life. Um, ultimately being incarcerated along with my two oldest brothers. Uh, I grew up in a really tough neighborhood in Roxbury, um, but it was a neighborhood that was fortified with love and community. Cool. Uh, the Dudley Triangle at one point in time was the poorest part of the city of Boston. It had 1,400 parcels of vacant land. Um, it was a community ravished by drugs and violence. At the same time, the residents there, many of them who didn't speak English or mm -hmm. who were poor, fought back and got eminent domain power of the land and built nice. their own housing and schools. Nice. And it was a place where you learned about tragedy, but you also learned about transformation. Mm -hmm. And I went to public schools my whole life until I went to John D. O'Brien School of Math and Science. And there I got involved in community work with the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, yeah, yeah, yeah. Teen Empowerment, the Orchard Park Teen Center. I was involved in a lot of youth programs and youth athletics. Uh, and I was able to do really well in high school and applied to top tier schools and was the first out of the John D. O'Brien to get into Wellesley. Oh, and I uh, went to college. Um, the problem with college is like most people, my family didn't know as a first generation college student. I worked two jobs throughout Wellesley, which is a very hard institution mm -hmm. uh, to work at all, mm -hmm. never mind working two jobs. And right. uh, really worked hard to get a degree out of that institution and decided to come back into my community. And I've been in youth and community work ever since. I've worked in philanthropy and education. I've been an entrepreneur. And I decided to run for office in the Fitz Suffolk District because it was my home. Mm -hmm. I love that community. Mm -hmm. You can't buy love. You can't 
uh, by passion, and I had been working on environmental justice, community development, housing, um, a lot of empowerment issues in my community for the better part of my life, right. and felt that the representation and the experience and the advocacy that I could bring to the State House was needed. So let me ask you two questions. First is, your community and civic engagement as a youth, how did that come about? I mean, was it that your mom whisper in your ear? Did somebody say, hey, you really should get involved with this? Or was it just walking down the streets in your neighborhood saying, you know what? We can do better, we can be more, and I want to be a part of the solution. How did it come about? I mean, there was two stories that relate to this. One is funny, and and one is, is pretty sort of sad. Mm -hmm. At five years old, we walked to school. We went to the Emerson School, mm -hmm. which is now the Dudley Neighborhood Charter School. Everyone in that neighborhood went to that school. Uh -huh. But I knew walking at five years old past Davies Market, an ideal sub shop, that it was different. My parents used to watch novellas. Mm -hmm. um, even though they weren't Spanish speaking, they, that was the closest thing to Cape Verde and Creole that they had. Right. And I remember watching the kids go to their schools and then walking to my school every morning and knowing that I didn't have any grass, I didn't have gym, I didn't have a library. Uh, mm -hmm. We had a little corner in our school where we had lunch and it looked very different than other schools. So I knew by kindergarten that something was different. It, fast forward to 13, I was actually littering um, and I was kicking a teeny juice bottle on Dudley Street into a vacant, dirty lot. And uh, I did that because we didn't have any trash receptacles. Mm. We had a lot of vacant, dirty, overgrown lots. And someone stopped me and invited me to a cleanup. So at the time, DS and I had a youth group called Nubian Roots. It's the same youth group where John Barrows, Linda yeah. Forey, yeah, yeah, Carlene yeah. Dorsina, I mean, we all came out of this uh, organizing group Nubian Roots because we just wanted to be together as young people and I went to my first cleanup and I never turned back. Um, no just the act of cleaning up my neighborhood um, taught me that you can turn really ugly things and painful things into beautiful powerful things and my step changed. By the time I got to O'Brien I really loved my community right. and I felt like young people could make a difference. That's a great story. Now fast forward to your time in Wellesley. Yeah. Now I don't know about you but when I, I, I Grew up in Harlem, um, single parent household in the projects, mostly black and Latino, actually all black and Latino, frankly. And I got a, an opportunity to go to Boston College. Yeah. And I got to Boston College and my first class was, uh, I was the only person of color. And I'd never been in an environment where I was the only, in fact, I was always in an environment where I was in the majority, yeah. not in the minority, so to speak. And it was somewhat daunting to be in that environment. And I remember thinking, these kids are so much smarter than I am. They're prep school kids or private yeah. school kids. And so I was that guy in the back of the room, you know, had his book up because I didn't want to be called on <laughs> until about three, four, five weeks later. And I'm listening to these kids. I'm like, I know this. You know, I can answer these questions. My question to you is, did you have like a shared experience like that when you went to college? Did you feel that you were out of your element and you actually had to kind of learn how this world worked juxtaposed to the world that you were coming from and grew up in? I have to tell people that Wellesley was the thing that changed my life, but it was also one of the most difficult things that I went through. Almost immediately, Wellesley is a town that is 10 uh, miles away from Roxbury, but that difference from coming from Roxbury to Wellesley was life altering. I mean, one is Wellesley's full of women who are at the top of their class around the world. Right. Uh, their brilliance is, is evident in getting into an institution like that. I remember three vivid uh, memories. One, the first week I walked on campus, girls were talking about where they went to school and they were all using one word. So Exeter, Andover, right. uh, Miss Porter's <laughs> boarding school. Uh, you know, <laughs> you know, one girl was like, I, you know, I'm the queen, um, the princess of this country. And another girl was, my dad is like this person in Taiwan. And I was like, oh, I went to the O'Brien. Yeah. And they were like, huh? <laughs> um, and I was so excited to come from a Boston exam school because I knew what I, I, I mean, people didn't really understand this, but I was 18 years old in college when my mom had me at 18 and dropped yeah. out of a Boston public high school. Yeah. The type of energy that I had to be there what didn't have anything to do with anyone else. I was just happy I survived. I, gotcha. I was happy that I'd arrived. And my first class, very similar, I took poli sci 100. I didn't know what the heck political science was. And I remember the teacher starting the class with, welcome ladies, uh, this is political science 101. Uh, many of you have read the text to Tocqueville and Machiavelli. 
Um, these are sort of political science sure. texts. Yep. And I was sitting in the back room thinking she was talking about Tupac. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like it's a funny story, but it's true. Like Machiavelli, is that who you're talking about? Um, but it's an interesting piece is because at the point cool. is that I spent the next weekend, yeah. uh, because I couldn't afford to buy the books, photocopying mm -hmm. all those books she talked about so that I could read them before Tuesday's class so that I could be caught up into a 100 political science class right. because I had never read those texts. Right, right. And the same thing for philosophy. Um, but what I learned at Wellesley was that although I was different and unique, that there was a place for me in the world. And that's what kept me there. I became a history and urban planning major. Okay. And in those two fields, I affirmed my existence. I studied a lot about black women in the movements. Mm -hmm. and. I was given the room. A school like Wells, it gives you the room to be liberal in your, your teaching and your thinking. So it ended up working That's out, but right. I also took a lot of Wellesley women back to Roxbury yeah. because one of the things I wanted to show women was that there's another world outside of this lake. That's right. That's right. Um, and it's a real place that needed real help. So you weren't intimidated? Uh, I think if it was intimidation, I think that I wasn't going to let them know. Yeah, I mean, right. when you grow up in the hood, like That's you right. learn this sort That's of right. uh, to wear your resiliency uh, with her armor, mm -hmm. and I believe that they saw that I added value to their institution just as they did. So tell us the causes, the top two or three issues that you really want to champion as a state legislator. It's a really difficult thing because a community at the Fifth Suffolk District has a 20% unemployment rate, okay. has a 36% wow. poverty rate. In certain places, it's a 62% female head of household. About 70% speak another language. It is the third most diverse district in the country. Uh, we have a large Vietnamese population, Latino, black, white, and 40% of the district is Cape Verdean American or Cape Verdean. And what I know for sure is that every issue is uh, at the forefront of people's minds mm -hmm. in our district, housing, jobs, mm -hmm. education, and particularly public safety. Where my soul's work is and my life's work is has been about young people um, and about gun violence. Mm -hmm. um, one in particular is I lost my youngest brother 13 months yeah, ago. I'm so sorry. Uh, so sorry. Thank you. And it totally changed me as an activist um, and as a youth worker. Losing Michael and the way that I lost him reminded me that there's still work to be done. Right. No one is immune. And that I need to look at this from a different angle, right? Because um, often when we talk about crime, we talk about good people, bad people. We talk about locking people up. But really, criminal justice and, and even public safety has a lot to do with social determinants, right? Uh, where are young people growing up? Are they hungry? Do they have somewhere mm -hmm. to live? How are they doing their education? So for me, I want to look at whole building whole people and whole communities. Right and because of that, I don't look at sort of issues sort of singularly, but as collectively. Um, when we address nutrition, housing, and education, we address public safety. And so for me, um, housing is an important piece of the work because I can't even afford to buy a home in the district that I love. Mm -hmm. It's a problem. It's traumatic. Gentrification is traumatic. Yes, yes. Um, and I look at crime, I look at it as a youth crisis. I, I don't think we're doing enough at the state or city level or even with the private and nonprofit sector to provide opportunity for young people cradle to career. Um, our district is about 40% under the age of 18. So I have to be a champion to bring people together around um, holistically looking at issues. Because often education people talk to education people, yeah, housing people talk right. to housing, jobs right. talk to jobs. Right. When these issues, you could give someone a home if they don't have a job to pay for it. How does that happen? That's right. If you don't right. educate someone and they're in a job, they're stuck. They can't move up the ladder. And so I want us to sort of look at more of a cyclical way to look. And I believe at the state house, that'll be a welcomed voice. So when I look at housing in particular, uh, youth development, out of school time, and then education, because education changed my life, those are the issues that I believe are going to change the other issues in our community. So now the past, I've, I've referenced the September 4th primary date here in the Commonwealth. You got into the race a little bit after others had gotten in yeah. or a little bit late. What was the deciding factor? What, 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 why did you say, you know what? I'm going for it. I'm going to do it. What, what pushed you? I mean, I, uh, I, yeah. I feel your passion about yeah. your community and being, you know, a public advocate. But what actually said, I'm going? 
Um, a couple of things. I am an executive director of a youth and community center, so one, I had to do my due diligence with the fact that I, a lot of people need me and a lot of people uh, loved me in my role and I needed to be respectful of the mm. fact that I loved my organization, gotcha. I loved right, working right. for young people in communities right. in Roxbury. Right, right. And so that took time. I also had to talk to my family. Running for office is a grueling, <laughs> emotional, yes, non-private experience. Right. And I needed them to be my first champions. And when I first talked to my mother, she said I was crazy. Mm -hmm. I had a good job. And she urged me not to, but she was my first check. Um, that's awesome. And I think, and she raised money from her little people that that's, work in the, you know, awesome. her fellow workers who work at the Sheridan with her. She's yeah. worked there for 38 years. Yeah. I said no a bunch of times to running. I wanted to be a thoughtful person in this. Anybody that jumps into something that is going to change not only yeah. your life, yeah, yeah but basically 40,000 people's lives, and that's the way that I looked at it. Right. Like, me running for office isn't about me. It's about the people who live in the Fifth Suffolk District who need a voice. And so after talking to a bunch of people, I talked to mentors, I talked to my family, I talked to uh, people, my colleagues. One particular conversation with a young person that had worked for me changed. Um, he said to me uh, a couple of things, but one of the most affirming things was that you're a great listener. Uh, you're a person that believes in young people. You've experienced many of the issues yourself, yeah. whether it be criminal justice or gun violence or going to public schools or living in a female head of household, single parent. You'll understand and you'll be thoughtful about this. And he said, I believed in you. And then that That's three awesome. weeks later, um, I was like, hey, let's do this. Let's do it. And it was hard. It's, it's, it's not easy. And no, yeah, it's no. not easy at all. No, it's easy. No, it's not <laughs> even close to easy. It's hard. It's expensive. You got to ask all your friends for money, and that hurts, you know? Yeah, and when they don't have it, particularly. Exactly, exactly. In fact, when I ran a couple of times, people would see my name pop up in the register, and they wouldn't answer the call. They're like, dude, we're done. We don't have any more money for you. But all of that said, I can feel your passion and your drive and your determination on the 4th of September, you won. Ayanna Presley won. It's going to be the first uh, female of color to be a United States representative, mm. congresswoman here. You had Anika Elgardo, I believe her last El name is. Elgardo. who uh, also is going to be a new state representative. Mm. You've got John Santiago. You've got Rachel Rollins, who, yeah. if she gets past her, the general and she's running against an independent, she'll yeah. be uh, district attorney mm. for uh, the Suffolk County. How did it feel to come in on that wave with that group of people, with so many people coming out to vote? Because we were told that it wasn't going to be a big turnout, but it was an overwhelming turnout. I don't know if it's because of what's going on nationally, what's going on with the guy in the White House. But how did it feel to ride in with that group of people? There really aren't any words. Um, as a young woman who comes from an immigrant poor family, um, just running for office was uh, one of the joys of my life. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that I was incredibly inspired uh, by the fact that we won and we won decisively. I think that was important because voters need to understand their power. And as a resident and as a person who votes, I spent a lot of time encouraging the people in my community to use their voice and their vote mm -hmm. as a way to understand their collective power. And we made a statement, I think they made a statement, that said that we want leadership, that one is more representative of our communities, but mostly aligned with the values that we see fit. I won every precinct. I set a record of 2,774 votes in a primary. Oh, congratulations. And I reject the notion That's that it nice. necessarily was a wave to that point because it took a lot of hard work. Yeah. I mean, when you're learning how to run for office, then you have to kind of act and do the work of knocking on thousands of doors and making those yeah. calls. And for many of us who won that day, we had no connection to each other's races. We all were sort of head down trying to change the world one voter at a time. Mm -hmm. But I can't uh, reject the notion that, like, they worked hard. Uh, yeah. They ran great races. And for me, having a grassroots positive campaign was the most important thing because I knew one thing. Beyond an election, our people need to be empowered, engaged, and connected. Mm -hmm. 
And if the vehicle to get them that way is to get them to vote in a primary and vote in a general election, we still have a lot of other work to do. Uh, are our people in civic organizations? Are they standing up to the type of development that they want? Right. Are they advocating for themselves? You know, these are things that we actually have to groom in our community. But I remember on the night of election, I wasn't allowed in my office. I didn't know what would happen. Um, I was told at 6 p.m. that to be at my home at 7.30 at night. Right. And I, I thought, oh, my God. Yeah. They want me to be at home at 7.30. Um, that's scary. Like, are they preparing me for bad news? Or, And I remember being in my home, and the first thing I did is I went home and took a shower. Mm -hmm. I cried in the shower. Mm -hmm. I'm like, vulnerable here yep. right now. Yep, yep. But I was at peace with whatever came because yeah. I knew I had did my best. And I did my best for us. And when I went downstairs and the election results came in, I heard about Ayanna first. Mm -hmm. And I was like gasping for air. I heard about Rachel second. And then I heard about Nika. And I was like, oh my God, what is happening here? And I wasn't even told my campaign staff started to cry. And they said, you want to know? And I was like, okay, girl, I'm getting my hair curled. Let me sit down. Uh, let me sit down. And they were like, you know, in a very calmly, just like the most of the race, which was well organized and yeah. sort of not knee jerk, was very thoughtful about how we approach things. Right. She said, you won and you won by a lot. And all I wanted to do was talk to my mom. Mm, and um, nice. that call to my mother and my family was the most important call. Yeah. And uh, I just want to encourage everyone like, it's when you grow up in this city, to understand that you can represent the people that are your neighbors and your friends. Sure. There's nothing, nothing can beat that. You know, after you go through a long campaign and you win, it's almost like a surreal experience mm -hmm. because all of a sudden, at least for me, like everything like just was going in slow motion, you know, and I'm sitting there and I'm saying, we won, yeah. you know, we <laughs> won. You know, and I remember when I got up the next day because you're so used to campaigning, yeah. mm -hmm. we didn't have to go campaign. And I was like, <laughs> I'm supposed to be doing, you know, how yeah, your body, no. you know, gets accustomed to things. And I'm like, I'm supposed to be doing something, but I'm not exactly sure what it is that I'm going to do. The reason I, I, I reference it as a wave is because, first of all, yeah. short of Ayana, I believe all of you were first-time candidates, yeah. you know. And generally, first-time candidates don't win. Second to that is, and I know you have yeah. because I've gotten a bunch of calls now yeah. from women, from folk in our community, folks uh, yeah. of, of color, saying, you know what? I watched what they did. I want in. Yeah. I want to be a part of the solution. I want to follow in those footsteps. And so I do believe, you know, 2018 is going to go down in yeah. history. And I'm not saying that lightly. It's going to go down in history. And, and people it should are going to be, be talking about this. It's, it's going a, to be. her story, history, That's right. moment, historical. Yeah. And the tide is turning in our, in our yeah. city, in our state. And for yeah. those of us who have been on the other side of the coin so often, yeah. um, ignored, not included, in the debate, um, not even having the equity and the justice we deserve to be at the table. I mean, in so many cases, like, it's still in 2018, we're the first yeah. or the only right. or the first woman or the first person of color. Right. And it's just unacceptable to be in a progressive commonwealth that we are. We need to be asking ourselves progress for home. I know for me, as a working class woman, I returned back to work part time. And um, there's still an election on November 6th, and we want to encourage our people to go. If there's anyone watching that wants to run for office, I want to remind them that there are a million and one ways to be an active citizen mm -hmm. and to inspire our communities to be active. One of, the, one of the things that inspired me was, like, there was all these dudes on the block, and uh, they thought they couldn't vote, mm -hmm. uh, many mm -hmm. of them had an uh, interesting system past. Involved. Yeah, system involved. And system possibly. involved, yeah. and they thought they were disenfranchised. Right. And I'm here telling them, actually, you can vote, That's and right. I'm going to help you, and That's I'm going right. to have someone pick you up. Right. And if you want to do an absentee ballot, you can. I mean, these were things that were foreign mm -hmm. to them. 18-year-olds, um, people who didn't speak the language but were so excited to vote but didn't know what a ballot looked like. Mm -hmm. So there's other ways to empower, and I want to encourage the people in our city that if you want to ensure that you have the leadership that won at the Democratic primary level, that you also contribute to that. Work on someone's campaign, volunteer, um, give some time to register people to vote. Today's National Registration Day, so... Oh, cool. So yeah. listen, so last week I saw you down at the Congressional mm -hmm. Black, Caucus, uh, Black, Black Caucus. Caucus Conference. 
How did it feel to be there now that you've won a campaign and you're walking amongst luminaries? Yeah. People that we've heard about like forever since we were kids and there, there he is or there she is and you can actually go talk to them and say, hey, I'm, I'm a part of this yeah. collective now. How did it feel to be a part of that community? I walked into the convention center floor and there was 10,000 <laughs> black people. I mean, besides being from Boston, it's no place I've ever seen right. 10,000 black people except in Roxburgh, right? right. But I saw Rep. Jackson Lee, I saw Jesse Jackson, I saw John Lewis, he was the first person I saw and he took a photo with me. I studied the civil rights movement backwards and forwards and to, to see him in the flesh and to send him say congratulations was amazing. Also, we had had a chance as four women to see each other, so it was very, oh. um, it was a sort of coming hood of sisters of like seeing them and just being able to hug them and say, Thank you and congratulations oh, was cool. a big deal. Yeah. And for me, there was a lot of first time candidates. Uh, the young woman who won in Connecticut yeah, yeah. Um, was there. And I was in awe. I, honestly, like I was starstruck. But the, my, my favorite, you know, you saw Kamala Harris, you saw Cory Booker, was Maxine Waters yeah. in a hot pink jumpsuit. Yeah. I, like, you can't be Auntie <laughs> Maxine. You know, that was. The most inspiring moment was to see myself up there yeah. and say to myself, this is, this is our story now. Right. Um, and so I, it was great to see, be with you even, to, to connect on this level of saying, like, we all play a part in improving the outcomes for our city's residents. And, you know, I'll tell you, Massachusetts actually leads the way in a lot of instances. And so... To, and I, and I, I remember seeing the four of you down there. I didn't know that was the first time that you all had yeah. just had an opportunity just to like fellowship and, and hang out with one another. So that was, it was really cool. And look, I want to thank you for coming on today, but I also want to say this to you. Um, clearly, you have an open invitation to come into our facility. Absolutely. I'd like you to come not only just to talk to the men, but equally as important, talk to the women. Yeah. Because a lot of the ladies there, uh, would rather not have visitation because they don't want their kids to see mom yeah. in a jumpsuit, you know, incarcerated and that sort of thing. And we have to pull together. I mean, to be the arguably the richest nation on the planet, yeah. to have as many citizens, American citizens, incarcerated and addicted to drugs yeah. and without jobs and struggling for housing, it's just, it's horrible. And it deeply impacts the person. I mean, with 23,000, I think, people in prisons in our commonwealth, um, it impacts the families. I remember going Absolutely. to South Bay, seeing my brother across a glass wall and promised myself that I would never come back and see him that way. And so it doesn't just impact the inmates, it impacts our entire communities, That's their right. children, like you, like you mentioned. And I'm willing to work together because gender responsive criminal justice reform is as important than That's just right. Um, looking at juvenile justice and other pieces of rehabilitation versus incarceration. Right. There are women in prisons for a multitude of issues, and many of which start with abuse. And um, we have to stop the cycle. That's right. um, I watched Ayanna Van Zant the other day, and it just inspired me to think differently. Um, we're always listening and learning. Well, listen, thank you for coming on today. Thank, thank you, you for sharing those shorts. Thank <laughs> you for bringing your enthusiasm and your passion to all of our viewers. Yes. Now, look, folks, we're out of here uh, today. We'll be back again next week. I hope you can feel the love and, and just the vibrancy from our two guests today. It's overwhelming, and this is just the beginning. It's going to get a lot better, and that's a long road that we have to travel, but we have to travel it together. We're out of here. Until next week, you take care. Peace. Oh.